If you remember those examples that we, that we used, there is some sort of a time period between the protest where activists get together, the protest that usually fails, and then a year later, two years later, or three years later, or some years later, they have another attempt. And in that time period, they're answering these questions. How do we uh, formulate grievances? How do we uh, uh, bring people in, etc., etc.? How do we make something that is uh, participatory enough, but also long-term and has a structure so we can mobilize people around the structure? So this, that's the, that's the uh, question. So, as I said, my, my uh, experience is uh, 1996, student protest. I was at the mechanical engineering studying uh, uh, thermal, thermal uh, dynamics, or actually thermal, uh, thermal engineering, uh, and uh, trying to finish that school and then emigrate and go to Canada. I heard that the Canadians were in need of engineers. And I didn't care much about politics. Uh, and then uh, there were local elections that opposition won in some 20 out of 160 uh, towns, which was a surprise because a week before there were uh, parliamentary elections where the opposition lost big time, the parliamentary elections. They got like five, six MPs out of 250 and then Everybody was like, meh. And then two weeks later, there were um, uh, these municipal elections, and uh, I think that Milosevic didn't realize. And, you know, they were also partying because they had a big success in the parliamentary election. And so then, you know, they lost those uh, uh, elections, local elections in 20, I think in 26 towns. And it was a shock, you know, like nobody expected it. And, and so they, like, because they were totally unprepared, they started rigging the, the election, but they, the way they rigged it, it was like out in the open and everybody saw it, and, and it created this uh, backlash. So, as a result, the university went on strike, and I kind of got dragged into uh, student activism. So I was with my friends, and uh, of course, you know, we were at the mechanical engineering, and uh, you know, usually it's the philosophy department and political science. These are the guys who are starting protests, not us engineers, but we have the biggest building and the biggest number of students. So the, the students from political science and from philosophy and sociology, they were marching down the street towards our building to get more people into the, into the protest. And we are standing there, friends, and we're like thinking, oh my God, this is going to be so embarrassing. These guys are going to come over and like nobody is going to come out from our building. Like no, no engineer is going to join the protest. You know, it's going to, everybody's going to make fun of us. And so what are we going to do? And so one of the friends said like, you know, we should go into the library. There are students studying there and we should ask them to come out and join the protest. And so for some reason they decided I should be the one to do that. So we went into the library, they put a chair, I climbed on the chair to invite people to come out for, uh, uh, to join the protest, and as I stand on the chair, I was like, ah, ah, and I completely lost my voice. And I couldn't say a word. I was like, ah, ah, and so like everybody in the library is like looking up, it's like, why is this guy standing on a chair, and like, totally like, couldn't say a word, you know. So finally they drag me down, somebody else climbs up and they're like, okay guys, let's go out, we have to join the protest, you know. But this is how I got involved, it was a complete accident, let's say, it wasn't my intention. And we, as I said, we were protesting for four months and it was, it was great, but in the end it failed. So when it failed, what is important is that, you know, we stayed in touch. So people who were part of that protest we stayed in touch. And it was a, a diverse group of people, you know. Because, you, you know, if you, if you think about Serbia, Serbia is a country that has a, how should I say, it's in the Balkans, so one of the things that the Balkans is known for is Balkanization. So everybody is in their small ethnic, ideological, and other 
chambers and that nobody wants to talk to each other because uh, there is like a big division. And so we have a saying, you know, uh, uh, two, Serbs, uh, two Serbs, three parties, uh, because, you know, everybody like is so uh, divided. And so what was important in this uh, moment where the protest is, is, is failing is that these people who stay together and who stay in touch, they are of the diverse ideological backgrounds. So we have left wing and right wing. Uh, we have communists and anarchists on one end and we have the, the monarchists, royalists on the other. So in Serbia, when you have royalists, you know, that's only part of the problem, because the other part of the problem is which dynasty, because we had two dynasties that were fighting. So even if you have, like, royalists, they may end up fighting each other, whether Karadjordjevic or Obrenovic dynasty should rule the country, you know. So it's a very, very difficult thing to unite people. So, but what was important there is that, you know, these people who, 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 who stayed in touch and who were building that movement, Despite their ideological differences, they wanted to work together. So they were willing to put aside those ideological differences. So although we had different organizations outside of the movement, some left wing, some right wing, some, you know, of different ideological uh, uh, orientations, people who were in the movement, they weren't representatives of those organizations in the movement. If, if they were part of those organizations, they were representatives of the movement in those organizations. So it was the other way around. So we were not a coalition. You know, people who were members of a political party, they were representatives of Otpor in that political party. Their loyalty was with the movement, not with that organization. And I think that was, that was important later. So at that point, we learned uh, we kind of look back at the protest and we learned two things, two mistakes. First mistake was leaders. One of the things we realized was, was a big problem in our, in our protest that, that, that failed was that we had a visible leader and he was sexy. Actually, we had two leaders. Uh, two guys with the same name, uh, Chedomir, uh, or as we call him, nickname Cheda. So there was one Cheda who was a prominent leader, and there was another Cheda, who was also a prominent leader. In order to, to distinguish them, we have gave them different uh, nicknames. So one, one Cheda was like really, like he had a swagger, and like the girls liked him. So we called that guy Cheda Sex. And the other guy who was like a geek with glasses, and all, we called that guy Cheda Anti-Sex. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Cheda Sex and Cheda Anti-Sex were the leaders of the protest. But, you know, what did they do as the, as the protest uh, was nearing an end? They were looking for their own career. So they joined political parties and they were, you know, becoming like, a, you know, kind of trying to, to cap capitalize on, on their activism. So when they joined political parties and continued their political career, the students who were part of the protest, they felt disillusioned. They're like, we were protesting for four months. Why? So these guys can you know, advance in their career. I'm not protesting again, any, ever. I'm not doing that again. So it was crazy. So we, we said, okay, well, next time we do, a, we do a movement, it has to be without leaders. So we're not gonna have leaders. But we understood that like, it's not enough to say we're not gonna have leaders because in that protest, we didn't decide to have leaders. How did these two Cheda, Cheda sex and Cheda anti-sex, how did they become leaders? We didn't elect them. What happened? The media elected them. Because when we were protesting in the street, journalists would come, you know, they were like, who wants to say something? You know, and Cheda says, oh, I'll say something. And so they blah, 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 blah. He says something. The next day, another journalist, he comes and he says, oh, I know that guy. I saw him on TV yesterday. So they come to him again. And so, because we didn't elect our leaders, the media elected the leaders uh, for us. So we said, ah, we need to kind of be more, much more careful with that. And so this is where we are moving from a protest to an organization. So we create a system in which we uh, recycle uh, our spokespeople. So everybody is going to be out there uh, speaking on behalf of the movement for a period of time. 
then he, he or she goes back, another one comes out, speaks for a, for a time, then they go back, and then this recycling is happening, so we are in control who is and, and for how long speaking, speaking for the movement. But more importantly, we made the decision to make this collective leadership, so that we create collective decisions, and it's not like one person that is making decisions, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team that is doing that. And also connected to that is that in all these towns, people have autonomy to do things on their own. So they don't wait, need to wait for somebody in Belgrade telling them do this or do that, but they have the autonomy within the, our, how should I say, strategy, within the goals that we want to achieve, but on the day-to-day -day basis they can run the show on their own. So that was the first thing, leadership. So we created this collective, decentralized leadership of the organization, or the, of the movement. And so then we could bring in uh, more people into that. The second mistake we saw from the protest was that while we were having fun and protesting and marching every day, a few hundred meters down the street, life was, life was normal. People were going shopping, they were going to work, they were you know, doing the things that they usually do while we were protesting for four months. And so we said, if we want to create change here, this is the thing we need to change. First, no protest. Protest is taking a lot of energy, but it, like life goes on normal uh, everywhere else. I, 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 instead of protesting, we should actually start uh, organizing around the country. And so when we started building Otpor, one of the things we did was to travel and to, to, to organize in, in, in uh, towns and villages outside of Belgrade. It was a slow and very tiring uh, process, but it created like a huge payback a few years later because we had the whole countryside uh, practically uh, resisting uh, the regime and the regime couldn't do anything about it because it was, you know, he had like loyal uh, police uh, troops, like the special forces that he would uh, use to clamp down on, on protest. But if the things were happening at the same time all over the country, it was impossible to send those loyal troops everywhere. So he had to rely on the local police to suppress uh, uh, the movement because the, only the local police was present everywhere at the same time. But the local police was not very willing to do that. So they did a lousy job of suppressing, which actually then made it even cool to be part of the movement because the cost of repression wasn't high. So then, you know, Everybody, like even high school kids, wanted to get arrested because then you are going to be the enemy of the state. The reason why they wanted to get arrested because there was no par price to be paid. There was no, there was no torture, there was no uh, repression, except like administrative uh, repression. And the reason why there was no torture and repre no repression is because, uh, you know, it was like the local police that was doing it. And they were like, when they have to arrest their neighbors, it's difficult. For instance, to give, you, to give you an example, so in the town of Kraljevo, which is uh, in the south, you know, they, at one point they declared us a terrorist organization, so there was an order that, you know, everybody who is connected to Otpor in one way or another needs to be arrested, so the local police chief arrests the, the local uh, branch of Otpor. He arrests everyone. And so he's in the police station and his phone rings and it's his wife and she says hey did you arrest some kids uh, today and he says of course i arrested the Otpor terrorists i got an order from belgrade and they're all arrested and the wife says like listen if you don't release these guys don't come home because neighbors have been calling since the afternoon and they're asking about the fate of their children. These are all good pupils, they have good marks in school, good grades, they never had any problems before. So, I don't want to have problems with my neighbors. If you don't release these guys, don't come home. You can sleep in your office and you'll figure out what you're gonna eat. And so this commander is thinking like, what do I do? Like, I have to listen to the minister of the police, but I also have to listen to my wife. And the minister is in Belgrade and my wife is, around the corner. So he released them. 
And this is the problem of the local police. It's because local police has local loyalties. It's very difficult to suppress people uh, with, with the local police. So when we started doing that, when we started reaching out to the countryside and started mobilizing in the, in the, in the what is it called, uh, uh, in the like small towns and, and villages, uh, we actually discovered that like things don't function as well as they do in Belgrade. And uh, that, that, that the regime is not having a firm control over what is going on there. So, you know, we discovered that people even had uh, independent radio stations there. That they just ran like on a, how should I say, like totally illegally. But nobody ever checked them because nobody cared. You know, or, or people who were supposed to care were bribed or, you know, they were totally competent. And so what we were surprised with was the, the level of, of uh, how should I say, uh, or the space that existed in, 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 in these areas. The problem was that they, these guys didn't care much about the, what was going on in the, in the capital, and they didn't care much about the politics that was going on in Belgrade. What they cared about was their own local uh, political uh, reality, which means the mayor, which means the, the, the judge, which means the local tycoon who bought the factory, these were the things that they were dealing with. So what we needed to do, and this is where that autonomy that we, that we had was important, was to adjust to the local circumstances so that the local branch of the movement could actually uh, uh, respond to the things that are, that are there. So, so this, this is the design. You know, th this is like the, the things that we had to do, had to do before we even uh, started building the movement. We had to think about these things. How do we make something that, that doesn't have leaders or that doesn't, uh, is not compromised uh, uh, through the leaders? And how do we make things that, that, how do we make a movement that can spread around the country? So let me just give you like a very brief uh, uh, run through these things. So, and, and this is kind of when we're talking about sustaining the movement over a longer period of time, because again, this is this has to have high participation, similar to the protest, but similar to the organization, this has to go on for years in order to succeed. So it has to have some sort of a structure. And so, to kind of again use the engineering logic uh, and kind of think like, what do we need to do? So there is the environment that we operate in. It can be a local environment or a national environment, but there are certain features of, of that environment that are known. And you know, the legal environment, political environment, social, economic environment, where the movement is operating. And then, you know, there are the goals of the, of the movement that we want to, something that we want to see. So when we talk about organization, Essentially, what we are doing is how do we understand the environment and relate it to the goals? That's our planning process. So how do we have an organization in which we will understand the, the environment and see how we can move closer to the goals that we want to achieve? It can be on the local level or on the national level. But that's the planning capacity. So we have to develop the, the planning capacity. So we understand there is a group, uh, it can be a demographic, let's say farmers or retired people, we want to in involve them in the movement. That is going to help us get closer to the goal. So we have to understand how, what these farmers want, what are their grievances, what, who are the people who are uh, influential among them, how are we going to reach out to them, and how we, how we can uh, get them involved. So we plan that. And then we have the implementation part, and this is actually how do we change the environment to get us closer to the goals. So we have to understand the environment to have the right goals, and then we, in the implementation, we change that environment a little bit. So this year, we don't have a certain capacity. A year later, we create that capacity. 
And so when we look, especially if you look at struggles over a longer period of time, let's say, in 1991, when we started our struggle against Milosevic, there wasn't a single NGO in the country. The NGOs didn't exist. In, uh, by 1996, there were five NGOs, and they were mostly like uh, offshoots of like Amnesty International or you know, like some big uh, Helsinki committee or something like that. After 1996, after the protest, we had a few hundred local NGOs, people who, after the protest, started self-organizing. So now we have a capacity that we didn't have before. We have a number of NGOs. You know, so, you know, same can be said for like uh, independent uh, uh, newspapers or, you know, that wild uh, underground radio station that, you know, the, that, that guy created. So there is that implementation is changing that environment so that we can then plan in the new environment and, and, and set up new goals, things that now we can do that we couldn't do a year before. And then keeping it all together is the management of that organization. So we have to manage that organization. We have to manage all those volunteers, all those people who are coming in and who are joining. Having in mind that this is not a traditional organization, so this is something where you have a lot of people who are coming in and not officially signing up, paying the membership dues and all that stuff. But these are the things that we need to have. So, just to go through the same thing. So in planning, we have to have the objectives, the campaign message that we are doing, you know, all these things that we need to develop. In the implementation, we have to do all these tactics and then we have to, in the management uh, of the organization, we have to have like the resource management, the skills, the structure of like how decisions are made, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all these, all these things are are uh, important to have. And so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend much time on on resources, but usually people say, you know. You know, there are material resources, uh, human resources, and time. With grassroots organizing, human resources are the key. We don't have material resources. So we, what we are, our big thing is that we bring people on board. So we create a mass movement. We cre create a broad-based movement. So we are uh, dependent on human resources. So that's our key advantage. It's not material resources. The other side may have material resources, but we are the ones who have human resources. And th this is our goal. And then when it comes to time, the idea is that uh, time is equal for everyone. You know, that's the great equalizer. And we all die. <laughs> that's also good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, especially when we know that some of the resources are not available, let's say material resources are not available to us, then we can start thinking how to be resourceful. How do we do things with less and how do we uh, do things that don't require material resources? And that leads us to the, to the human resources as the central thing. So it is important to know that in a movement, we have a structure of the movement but people are organizing around that structure. So movements don't have members as such that you like you would have in an organization. But you have certain people that are usually called organizers that are dedicated to the movement. And so these organizers are planning, they're responsible for implementation, they're responsible for day-to-day -day activities, and they're usually the organizers in the movement. And then there are people that we usually call activists, these are people who take part in the actions of the movement, but they won't be there every day. They would come for the action, you know, is it a protest or is it like a, I don't know, street theater or is it like a petition drive or something. They would, they would join for that, but they wouldn't be there all the time. And then, you know, we have the supporters, so they are people who are, you know, supporting the movement, but they're not very active. So it's very important to understand that actually organizers are the ones who are keeping the skeleton of the movement. And then all these others are organizing around it. And so that, this is how we can achieve huge mobilization. Because we don't, uh, 
we actually rely on activists and supporters and even the general public that is outside to to create this uh, to create this mobilization so because we don't have much time i'm not going to go through this but you know but we can maybe in the in the question time we can talk about it but it is important to specify what are the roles of these people this is what you know what is important because we don't have we're building a movement we're not building an organization traditional like political party or a trade union or a, or an ngo so we don't have bylaws we don't have the committees that are going to run things people are going to run things as individual volunteers so they have to know what do they do and how do they do it how they can help the movement what is it that you want me to do as an organizer and how am I going to do it? And when that is clear, people can take initiative and, and do it. And so I just want to, how shall I say, uh, give a shout out to Bill Moyer. And he, when he uh, defined uh, four leadership roles, so he said like, you know, there are some people in the movement are rebels, some people are kind of citizens, they give legitimacy to the movement. Some people are like change agents, so they're mostly behind the scenes organizing and, and planning, but they're not like rebels in the sense that they're going to go out and get arrested. And some people are reformers, so they get, how shall I say, that these are like people who, who are engaged in negotiations with the other side, or they're, you know, writing down the, the proposals for policy change or whatever. But, you know, I don't want to go into details of that. You can, you can, you can read uh, more about this. I think there is an uh, article is on the ICNC website, uh, uh, this Moore's article. But what is important here is that, you know, if you want to build a movement, you can't rely only on rebels. You have to have different uh, leadership roles in the leadership. So you have to have rebels, you have to have citizens, meaning like people who are just representing the citizenry, and you have to have like people who are uh, more like a reformer and, and, and change agent. And so, and as I said, you know, time is the great equalizer. So that is, you know, our opponent may have a lot of money, our opponent can, can have uh, this or that resources, but the time is the same for all of us. And that is a good thing because, you know, usually in most cases these guys are older than us. So this is, I always, I always put that as, a, as, an important, uh, as an important thing. So I'm just, before I give it uh, the floor to Janjira, I just want to say that, you know, there are three three ingredients for this organization that are important and they're especially important in uh, these uh, uh, informal organizations and it, I usually use the, the minimal organization which is the two people dancing as a metaphor for that so in order to have a successful dance with your dancing partner the first what is the first thing that you need to know the first thing is that both of you you have to agree on the moves. So you have to know the steps of the dance. So is it a waltz or is it a tango or is it... You hear the music, you have to know the, the right steps. If you don't know the right steps, then you're going to be stepping on each other's toes. So coordination is there. You have to coordinate your steps in order to have a successful dance. Another thing that you have to do is trust that the other side also knows the, the steps. And then the third thing is the ability to communicate that. So like, do you, know the, 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 do you know this dance? Yes, I do, of course. Let's do it. The same is with the movement. You know, you have uh, different chapters, especially in a horizontal movement, and they have to coordinate. They have to trust each other that they're going to coordinate uh, things, and they're going to do it in, in unison, each in their own town or in their own region. And they have to be able to communicate Directly, So they don't need to go through the leadership, but they can actually, in a horizontal organization, they can communicate directly. And so if one of the things breaks down, you can use the other two to, to bring it back up. So if the coordination breaks down, you know, you still trust the, the, the other people in the movement and you use communication 
to see why the coordination broke down, what can we do to repair it. If the communication breaks down, so you can't communicate with them, you still have trust that they're doing what they're supposed to do and that you have the coordination, you, you know the steps, you, need, you know what you need to do. You know, and in a, in a sense, where the trust breaks down, which is probably the most problematic, you know, there is still the coordinated effort and the communication to repair that trust so that the movement can keep going. And so I can give you an example, you know, when, when they were arresting us, and this is how I'm going to end, when they were arresting us, we had this thing called Plan B, which was like the protocol, whenever somebody is arrested, you know, there was like the things that, that, that we knew we had to do. First thing is, you know, we immediately call the police station to inquire about the person who is arrested, and we send the lawyers, then we inform the media, then we inform the uh, NGOs that are uh, kind of p protecting uh, human rights, then we uh, organize people to go in front of the police station and to protest and to demand uh, the release of the, of the person who is arrested. In the meantime, the lawyers should also be there in the police station. So there was like a whole protocol. So, so when I was arrested, you know, I was like no communication with anybody. Like I'm there in the, in the prison cell, but I'm kind of thinking, okay, by this time, they probably called the police station already. And then like 15 minutes later, I'm sitting in that cell and I'm thinking, by this time, they already contacted the lawyers. So the lawyers should be here. Then like an hour later, I'm thinking, by this time, they probably informed the media that I was arrested. So but I'm only guessing. I don't know any of that. And so after like a, another hour, I'm saying, okay, I'm, I'm in this prison cell for like last three hours. So by this time, they probably mobilized somebody to come over to the police station and to protest my arrest. So finally, they take me out of the prison cell to take me for questioning. And as I'm walking down the corridor, I hear the noise outside of the police station. And I'm saying to myself, they are here. And like my trust shoots up. Like I trust my friends. I trust my comrades. Because what we agreed we are going to do they did it, you know, and that, that is the glue that keeps the organization together. That is the glue that keeps the movement together. And then everything else is possible. Everything is possible because you believe that they're going to do their part and you're going to do your part and everybody's going to do what is necessary so that we can uh, achieve the, the, the goal at the end. So this is where I'm going to... And, and uh, we're going to have questions.